Yes, I'll do that. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Balkan Devlan. I'm a senior fellow here at the McDonald Laurier Institute, and um, I lead the transatlantic program at the Institute. Welcome to the Securing the Flank, defending Canada's allies and partners from the Baltics to the Black Sea. This is the third in our um, uh, series of uh, webinars that we uh, put forward uh, together with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, here in Canada uh, that looks at the global realignments. We had uh, previous uh, webinars as well as uh, private strategic dialogues on the Middle East and the Red Sea, as well as on the Indo-Pacific. Those events you can go and watch um, on our website. Today, we will be looking at the eastern flank of the transatlantic um, community and what kind of challenges we face. The lands between the Baltics and the Black Seas are once again at the forefront of securing democracy and freedom in Europe. This time around, though, the threats are more diverse and ambiguous than Soviet tanks of the past. Our adversaries, primarily Russia and increasingly China, continue their attempts at subverting our democratic institutions and societies. Their toolkit ranges from now familiar disinformation campaigns to cyber attacks, from political warfare to corruption, as they use economic leverage, energy dependence, and critical infrastructure vulnerabilities to coerce, bribe, or corrupt business and political elites. Um, they also use conventional military forces, like we see in, uh, in Ukraine, as with the Russian, uh, uh, Russian aggression uh, there. Um, Canada and its allies need to pay closer attention to this region, which can be seen as the canary in the coal mine uh, for the security and prosperity of Europe, and by extension, the transatlantic community, including Canada. We need to ensure the resilience of democratic societies in the region, confront and counter our adversaries' attempts at subversion, and deal with intra-alliances uh, alliance challenges uh, to secure our societies, ensure our prosperity, and defend our values. I'm very pleased today to, um, to moderate this panel uh, of distinguished experts um, to talk about what Canada is doing, could do, and should do to meet these challenges at the eastern flank of the transatlantic community. Our panelists today uh, don't need much extensive um, introduction. They're all uh, very well known to, to Canadian and international audiences, so I will very briefly introduce them. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Christian Leprecht, who is a Monk Senior Fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute and a professor at Royal Military College and Queen's University. Uh, Christian is a household name when it comes to defense and security here in Canada, and, and his, his, his commentary and writing and research uh, has been very influential in, in shaping um, the public debate and policy uh, on, on these issues. Um, our second uh, panelist uh, is, is Gilles Sinclair, who has an illustrious career uh, throughout uh, the Canadian government and currently serves as the Canadian representative to Ukraine Defense, for, Defense Reform Advisory Board. Um, so she will be providing quite on the ground, hands on um, uh, you know, experience and perspective uh, when it comes to uh, the resilience of that of this society. Uh, our third uh, panelist is uh, Roman Rashchuk, um, who has an extensive uh, diplomatic uh, career that includes uh, being the ambassador of Canada um, to uh, Ukraine and whose uh, interventions on this, um, on this particular subject about the eastern flank is, is very well known and very much appreciated. Lastly, but not least, uh, Marcus Kolga was a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute and the director of the Disinfo Watch, um, who is uh, perhaps among the uh, top um, uh, you know, disinformation experts here in Canada and a noted um, human rights activist uh, who will be talking about um, how uh, our, our societies, as well as our partners and, and allies societies, are under attack um, uh, by, by our adversaries and try to subvert our, our democracy. I don't want to take more time um, going through the bios because <laughs> we will then spend half of the uh, seminar uh, doing that. Um, and I'd like to turn to um, Christian first um, to, um, to talk 
uh, about to provide us with a, a lay of the land. Um, uh, you know, wh wh what is Canada doing um, today uh, in the eastern flank from Baltics to the Black Sea? And why are we here? Uh, over to you, Christian. Thanks, Balkan, for the kind introduction, and thanks also to McDonald Laurie Institute and its efforts to continue to um, contribute to a informed discussion um, to raise uh, the level of discussion in Canada on these important issues, especially at times when uh, democracy and the transatlantic relationship is under considerable strain. And to that effect, also thank you to the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, not just for its work in Canada, but its work more broadly. Um, in facilitating conversations, awareness, informed discussion, uh, and advancing uh, uh, policy um, and decisions, um, not just in uh, Germany, um, but across the globe uh, with its efforts um, on transatlantic security um, and the Euro-Atlantic uh, community in general and the Euro-Atlantic security community in particular, because I think in the coming decades, uh, it will become uh, even more vital to our uh, democracy, prosperity, um, political stability, um, and the future of the way of life that we all cherish uh, than it has proven for the past uh, um, um, 70 odd years. So on that note, um, if we, so I'll try to make sort of three broad points. One related to Canada's activities in the region and the broader strategy behind those activities. The second related uh, to Russia and Russian revisionism and and uh, and and its revanchist posture, uh, and the third with regards to the United States and uh, the uh, way the United States has been reallocating some of its um, attention and resources elsewhere and those broader implications, um, and then uh, I'll, I'll let my much more experienced um, uh, colleagues draw some of the, uh, the the more specific inferences I think that follow from this. So if we um, and so Eric, if you have a moment, you can bring up the map uh, that uh, uh, that we have here. So this is a map of current operations in which the Canadian Armed Forces, in one way or another, are engaged in. And so just to draw attention, so you can of course extend this map. Uh, across the Arctic because uh, and over into the Asia Pacific theater. And so you can see the entire domain that Canada has to cover from our Pacific Ocean through the Arctic and uh, down through Europe. But you can see that the uh, theater in Europe, of course, uh, has long been particularly contested and Canada knows this uh, very well firsthand. Uh, given that it was uh, first to the draw, uh, both in the First and Second World Wars. Um, and uh, as some people have uh, liked to point out that the Europeans like to fight their wars down to the last Canadian. And so Canada, um, so why does Canada get engaged? Because Canada has learned that it has a strategic interest in uh, stability, territorial integrity, um, uh, economic prosperity, and social harmony uh, in Europe, uh, Europe as Canada's most second most important strategic partner relationship after the United States, and also a way to counterbalance uh, some of the weight of the United States, especially for a country such as Canada that shares the continent with the US. And so you can see these imperatives playing out very clearly if you look at the uh, at the pins on the map that stretch from the Baltic Sea. Uh, through our commitment, uh, not just our, our land commitment in Latvia, but for instance, to the air policing mission um, and some of the ad hoc maritime operations that we engage in uh, through Ukraine, uh, the Balkans, um, Canada has a presence in every country around Syria with the exception of Syria itself. Uh, in some of those areas, Canada has a very long standing presence, such as for instance, some of the, uh, the, the UN mission um, with regards to the Golan Heights. But then also Canadian presence uh, in Egypt, uh, the counterinsurgency uh, presence as an advise and assist mission uh, in Niger, our capacity building mission in Tunisia, including our contributions, the Canadian contribution in particular uh, to the NATO DEEP program. Uh, so it's important, I think, to see the enhanced forward presence in the context of Canada's larger, broader strategic engagement, not just on the Northeastern front, but running uh, right along the southern fl fl flank, if you think about the flank sort of from the Black Sea through the central Mediterranean to the western Mediterranean, everything from uh, containing Russian um, 
revisionism uh, to um, counterterrorism um, operations um, and to some of the uh, migrant challenges in the Western uh, Mediterranean and combining all that with um, uh, trying to build more resilient institutions and more resilient societies. And of course, uh, all this um, in uh, collaboration with NATO or through NATO um, and this NATO is a collective defense organization. It is a, but is also a political organization of common interests, common values. Um, and this is what Canada has over the decades come to do and come to do well, which is the collective defense piece. Um, and that is what we're doing um, across, um, across the region, whether in NATO member countries or in countries along the periphery. And so the enhanced forward presence for Canada was a logical extension, especially in a time when um, uh, a, someone needed to step up to take on uh, Latvia uh, as the framework nation. Uh, Latvia is also particularly interesting because of how colorful that particular mission is in terms of the number of uh, troop contributing countries. And so it's also an opportunity to do what Canada has also always had an interest in, which is to build synergies, synergies among member countries, and in particular in the current environment, to build out synergies uh, among member countries um, outside of necessarily uh, an immediate U.S. support and U.S. leadership, because as we'll see in a moment, as some of that uh, drifts or pivots away from Europe, I think it'll become more important Canada, for Canada to play um, this type of, uh, to resolve some of these collective action problems and to make sure that we can become uh, better and more effective within our collective defense arrangement, uh, even with um, some waning U.S. Uh, support. Uh, operationally and perhaps also strategically. The second set of comments uh, relates to um, Russia. And yes, we all know sort of about Russian operations along um, uh, the entire flank and the sort of efforts to um, undermine societies, um, uh, not just calling their territorial security into question, but also their societal resilience and their prosperity. Uh, the challenge that we find ourselves in, especially since um, 1999 and the rebuilding of efforts, for instance, such as su uh, Russian submarines, and especially since 2007 um, and the clear turn by the Putin administration uh, to consider um, uh, to, of the antagonism uh, that uh, Russia has uh, instigated with, uh, with the West, West. But all that under a considerably reformed uh, much more robust, uh, much more capable uh, Russian armed forces uh, that learned hard lessons in its conflict in uh, in Georgia um, and is now showing itself to be a force to be reckoned with uh, conventionally in the hybrid quotation marks sort of asymmetric space when it comes to cyber, but also in terms of its nuclear developments, in terms of its missile and hypersonic missile uh, developments and its underwater unmanned uh, systems, vehicles, um, that Russia has been working on. So um, certainly a, uh, um, a a hostile power that is uh, is is showing that it um, it it still has strengths, considerable strengths to offer. And the reason I point this out is because this is important to consider in an environment where the United States simply has, I think, fewer resources and uh, a uh, and less attention span to offer. Uh, for Europe and for collective defense in Europe. And so we find ourselves in a relatively historically since the end of Cold World War, uh, unique situation where we have a, an emboldened uh, Russia with uh, gr growing and reinforced capabilities and capacities and a clear commitment to put these to use at the same time uh, that the United States is able to contribute less and pay less attention to Europe. And so it means that among um, allied countries, we need to think about how can we harness our own resources and synergies more effectively in that framework in order to be able to demonstrate clear uh, deterrence capabilities. And deterrence, of course, is a combination of capabilities um, and commitments. And so what Canada is doing is on the one hand, uh, showing a clear commitment, not just to Latvia in terms of the enhanced forward presence, but across the along the entire NATO flank um, and capabilities, both in terms of bringing its capabilities to bear, but building those capabilities. And I think um, in a fiscally constrained uh, environment that we live in, especially post-COVID, it's going to be ever more important that we take the capabilities that 
uh, we have collectively as allies and making them work as best as we can uh, together. Because if there's no new money and we're not going to have a bigger NATO, then I think we can certainly have a better NATO, uh, notwithstanding the increases um, uh, that uh, we have seen in some me uh, member countries post Wales. And the third point is regard with regards to the United States. The United States that, of course, has provided um, the framework for post-World War II um, political stability and uh, yeah, Eric, I think you can take the map down um, for political stability and for economic prosperity um, that we, from which we have all benefited. Uh, the challenge with that has been it's also generated a bit of a um, uh, um, of, of I think some co some complacency on the part of allies, um, and I would count Canada and Germany among that in the sense that we haven't really had to think very hard about strategy or grand strategy in the sense that. Uh, we simply draft behind the United States and we hitch our wagon to the United States and to the transatlantic security relationship. And so what we've seen is um, a United States that is more preoccupied with itself domestically in terms of its own uh, divisions and its own challenges, which means necessarily that administrations have less uh, bandwidth to look outside of the United States. Um, and so that means it's just going to be, I think, more difficult to get U.S. attention um, on these matters, let alone the extent of attention that uh, we have um, been able to, to, to benefit from in the past. In the United States, I think what we've also seen is its interests pivot, the European theater, but also the Middle Eastern theater. And we see this, uh, whether it's in Syria and Afghanistan, is a secondary theater from a strategic perspective from the United States. Uh, the main action is happening in the Asia Pacific um, and to some extent in the Arctic and along the northern uh, northern flank. And so this is why you see the United States not just putting so much attention on the Asia Pacific. You can see this in terms of deployed assets. Two thirds of U.S. deployed assets um, are now in the Asia Pacific theater. And so I think we live uh, in a time when uh, U.S. interests um, are the, and U.S. priorities might not as nicely align with those of Canada and other NATO allies as they have in recent decades. And so uh, without prejudice to the United States, that means that those allies will have to think harder about, well, uh, how is it that they are going to be able to assert their interests if they're simply going to be, if they can't count on the sort of uh, U.S. support and the sort of U.S. leadership uh, that they've been able to benefit from in the past. And I think this is uh, comes to bear in sort of a concrete fashion when we look at some of the Canadian policies and come some of the Canadian decision making that um, um, the we actually need to develop a more mature um, and uh, emancipated capacity for our own strategic thinking and our own grand strategy um, in light of the developments that we're going to see. And uh, as I always like to end with these presentations, uh, look, there's going to be 3 billion more people in the world, um, and most of them are going to live in the country's hardest, uh, most affected by climate change that are already uh, politically, economically, socially, uh, some of the uh, um, the 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 least um, able to absorb these types of challenges. Uh, add to that the uh, challenge posed by China and then Russia um, in the European theater, as well as along the Arctic and uh, uh, and northern flank. And there's going to be a lot of heavy lifting to do uh, with relatively limited assets. And the Canadian Forces likes to call this operational frontage. There's a lot of operational frontage. Uh, with very limited resources and growing demands. Uh, and that is going to require uh, some hard decisions, but also clear political leadership and clear strategy in terms of how do we allocate the resources do we have for uh, greatest effect in terms of Canadian interests. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks for, uh, for the opportunity to weigh in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for this comprehensive um, view of, of lay of the land and, and what seems to be the, the, the defining elements uh, for Canadian um, strategy and, and, and foreign policy thinking that needs to be in the next 10 years. I will come back to what you know, specific policy uh, recommendations you might have to match those limited resources with these emerging strategic challenges um, later on. Now, I want to turn to uh, Jill to, um, to, to get it. 
a, a sense of how uh, how things are, what, what Canada is doing and and how you know this, the, the developments, particularly um, in 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 Ukraine, going out. You are sort of very much involved in, in especially with the defense uh, reform. Um, you have a first hand uh, knowledge. You're at the table. Um, uh, give us a sense of what what Canada is is in Ukraine and how um, um, our interests and values and our partners uh, working with them over there is is, is defended. Well, thanks very much, Vulcan, and thanks uh, also to MLI for the session on securing the flank. Um, and thanks to Christian for setting things up so well in a very, very comprehensive way. Uh, when we talk of securing the flank, you've asked us to look from the Baltic to the Black Sea. And I'm going to speak for a few moments on a specific crucial partner you've mentioned already in that broad transatlantic community and security space, which is Ukraine. Uh, and I know people don't always think about Ukraine as a as a, a partner in security space, but I'm going to walk through a few a few thoughts that might uh, influence or open people's minds here. I mean, we know just looking at the map that we've just uh, ha had in front of us, Ukraine's at the crossroads or the center of Europe, uh, and it's the transatlantic community's easternmost democratic partner. And Ukraine is still in transition. We all know that, uh, but Ukraine is a real partner. Uh, Ukraine contributes to every NATO operation, something that I'm not sure is uh, very widely known. And Ukraine's stated goals and trajectory are to align and integrate itself as a member of the Euro-Atlantic community. In fact, it's entrenched in the Constitution and it's driving a massive reform and transformation effort from judicial to economic, health, education, across the security services. And as you've mentioned, uh, that's where I'm most familiar with things because I work on the Defense Reform Advisory Board. Things are obviously not perfect in Ukraine. They're not perfect in any country, we could easily say. Uh, but I think for those who think of Ukraine only in terms of, say, war or corruption, I'd like to broaden the view a little bit uh, in the wider context. There's no question that Ukraine is a strategic partner in Euro-Atlantic security. And Christian's you know, laid out a little bit how we should think about our broader strategic context here. And it's a partner for Canada and it's a partner for NATO. Um, and, Can and, and Ukrainians feel this, which I think is very important because often when we speak of operations and where Canada is, we're sort of, you know, pulling people into democracy, whereas, uh, you know, whereas in Ukraine, we're supporting people who have decided that they want to take this step forward. Uh, in a poll I saw just today, 73% uh, of Ukrainians see Euro European integration as a key and constant priority and objective. Imagine getting that sort of polling on a foreign policy issue out of Canadians. I'm not sure there's such attention to foreign policy. And, you know, Ukraine is actually a, a courageous democracy. We talk in passing about the war, but uh, and we can take a deeper dive into this. But every single day, the sorts of things that Christian's spoken about, I mean, the hybrid, asymmetric, insidious effect, impact um, of Russian aggression manifested either in traditional kinetic ways or in non-traditional, highly effective, relentless ways is present in Ukraine. And you've asked me to focus a little bit on what Canada is doing. Um, and in a few words, uh, I would say that, you know, we are deeply invested in the sovereignty, the security, the democratic and, and economic development of Ukraine. And at my peril, I speak of these things with Roman in the, in the room here so he can jump in and correct and supplement. Um, you've asked why we're kind of there. And I think uh, sort of the instinctive, predictable answer that you often hear uh, from people, why are we in Ukraine and why do we care, often rever reverts back to the Canadian-Ukrainian community, 1.3 million strong. And whilst it's a massively dynamic, powerful, influential, and extraordinary community, and Roman Vlasichuk is part of it, that's not the whole story. And I actually don't think it's the real story either. Canada's in Ukraine because it is in our strategic interests. And we can talk about this later, but I think it's interesting that we don't always have a clear notion of our strategic interests. But interestingly, Ukraine has always presented its, itself as in our strategic interests because it also reflects our values, our interests in a secure and sovereign, democratic Ukraine. This was present even before Russia's egregious violations of Ukraine's sovereignty and international law with the illegal occupation of Crimea and the war it continues to sponsor and drive in the East. 
Canada's engagement in Ukraine is in effect a forward deployed presence. I don't think we'd ever use quite that terminology because it, it, when you say forward deployed, it always has a military connotation, but it's forward deployed in a very broad sense. It's a, it's a, political, it's a political commitment uh, to support democracy, a political commitment to support transition, transformation, better governance, better democracy, and security and, and, uh, security and uh, sustainability of democracy. And our presence with Ukraine and our investments are equally focused on governance, rule of law as the foundations of sustainable democracy, as much as in supporting the professionalization of the armed forces and the security sectors, which are democratically accountable instruments of democracy, obviously. 30 years ago, uh, you know, we recognized the importance of Ukraine's realization of its independence, and we've been investing since then. This democratic, prosperous, stable Ukraine provides this pillar of stability in the Euro-Atlantic space, which is, again, as Christian has just reminded us, this is Canada's geopolitical space. And recognizing that is key, that this isn't just something we're doing because we're, we're nice, though we may well be, but this is really, this is our geopolitical uh, security space. In the area that I work most closely with, with defense, um, since 2015, you know, Canada has been training the Ukrainian security services with a primary focus on the Ukrainian armed forces. Through Operation Unifier, the Canadian armed forces have been doing an extraordinary job of training uh, Ukrainian armed forces personnel, as well as the National Guard. We've had a, a 200, continue to have a 200 strong contingent on the ground um, in Ukraine. It's headquartered in Kyiv. Um, and it's training across Ukraine in about 13 different places. Um, we've probably touched about 25,000 security personnel in our training efforts to date. But what's sig significant about this training effort is that um, it's not just focusing on tactical training. Certainly it's doing that, good soldierly skills, professionalization. But increasingly we're looking at the institutional uh, development that has to underpin all of that. And this gets back to the theme of securing the flank. It's all about building strong democratic institutions and practices that are foundational to democratic to resilience and to security, especially in an era of hybrid warfare, when the whole intent of that is to undermine and chip away at and cast a doubt at and question the very, the very um, innards of our democracy and to erode trust. So securing the flank by building strong democracies is the essence of a good security posture. In Ukraine, we're working in a multinational setting on the ground. We work with the US, the, US, the UK, Lithuania, Poland, Sweden, Denmark principally. Um, and everybody in that group and the wider NATO family recognizes that it's very important to work with Ukraine as a partner. Uh, and NATO itself has recognized the importance of Ukraine as a partner in granting Ukraine enhanced opportunity partnership in 2020. EOP isn't something that's spoken about uh, that much, but interestingly, it's a very small and select group of countries that sit in this enhanced opportunity partnership space with Ukraine, Australia, Finland, Georgia, Jordan, and Sweden. So clearly this NATO decision had both political and operational significance. It recognized the contributions, as I said, of Ukraine to NATO's broader security space, but it also was sending a political signal of support to a country that's on the, the front lines, literally and figuratively, of everything that we're, we're focusing on. Um, NATO, uh, as an alliance, uh, as I say, has recognized the strategic significance of Ukraine. And interestingly, just yesterday, the Deputy Secretary General spoke about the Black Sea region as being at the forefront of NATO's agenda. And clearly, um, Ukraine has a big chunk of the Black, the Black Sea region, though um, Russia would like to make it a lesser chunk. Um, and the Deputy Sec General of NATO also spoke about the need to take a 360 degree view and approach to NATO security, which I think provides a very good context for the discussion you're setting up here about how do we look across from the Baltics to the Black Sea in that sort of comprehensive way. Um, you know, Ukraine is a, a living lab of modern hybrid warfare. As, I, as I've said, it's subjected daily to these, these threats and this undermining of democracy. Ukraine itself is taking a comprehensive view of security. Um, I think it's a place where Canada can not only partner, but we can also learn from Ukraine because it is a living laboratory of modern warfare. 
and it is a trusted partner as we think about how best to secure our flank. So with that, I think I'll leave it here in terms of opening comments. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. This is an excellent overview of, I think, what we are doing in Ukraine and why it is important for us. And actually, I really like the fact that you end up with the with, with the fact that this the, the ongoing situation that, that Ukraine is being under attack, not only sort of conventional forces every day, you know, Ukrainian soldiers are uh, you know, wounded or, or, or dying, but also a variety of, of um, subversion uh, mechanisms from cyber attacks to, to, to corruption that Ukraine has to deal with, that we can learn a lot from. So it's, I think, a two-way street. And I'd like to make, give a, a shout out to the um, the commanding officer of the Canadian forces in uh, in Ukraine in, in the Operation Unifier, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Melanie Lake, which I had the uh, the pleasure of, of ha you know having a chat and, and listening to in, a, in another platform, uh, doing an excellent work and and and, and you know uh, working with our partners there and and bringing uh, the expertise um, and and um, the, the 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 experience uh, uh, of Canadian armed forces in in supporting our our partners in Ukraine. Um, now I'd like to turn to uh, uh, Roman um, to uh, Roman. You had a, an excessive experience as, as a diplomat, as an ambassador, and you have been to the, the Canadian ambassador in in, in Ukraine. Um, could you give us a sense of you know what how our involvement in 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 Ukraine developed? What are we doing right now? And perhaps touch upon on things that you see as, as, as things that need to be corrected and, and improved on a, a little bit. Over to you. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Uh, we've been engaged for, uh, at least in the um, military and security sense, uh, for six years. Uh, Canada was the first country to provide uh, non-lethal military equipment. This was in November of uh, 2014, uh, the first country to actually send an airplane into Kiev airport, uh, which was seen as highly symbolic and much appreciated. We donated our entire ex-Bosnian stock of winter uniforms, which basically clothed the third wave of uh, Ukrainian mobilization in the winter of 2015. I got many uh, grateful soldiers telling me about how they were warm and dry because of Canada. Uh, and we've been working very systematically, as uh, as Jill has described, on military reform. Uh, one of the problems of success, and we've been through now, I think, 12 rotations of Canadian troops, is that it doesn't attract the same attention as disaster. Uh, the uh, I, I was following in, in, in the current uh, discussion about uh, the uh, very messy Afghanistan evacuation. Uh, a retired Canadian forces uh, officer uh, defending the forces by saying, look, they're doing all sorts of things. They're doing maritime rescue. They're uh, fighting fires in uh, Western Canadian communities, etc." But even this veteran didn't mention Operation Reassurance or Operation Unifier. Uh, they are so smoothly running and so well integrated in their host societies that they're not a shiny new thing or a kind of dumpster fire. Uh, both of which are what tend to attract both policymakers and practitioners. Uh, so I think it's uh, important to underline, and, and Jill's mentioned it in part, that these are environments where we are working with the grain. And you'll be seeing a paper, uh, I think, with, with that title uh, coming out soon, uh, in the sense that these are countries that want to defend themselves, they have considerable uh, you know, intellectual and other capacities already. Uh, they require, uh, and, and that is true of Ukraine, it's also true of Latvia, uh, they require tweaks and improvements to their system, they require some reinforcement, uh, but they are highly motivated and highly willing to learn and to return the favor by teaching us things that we do not know, especially about the conventional uh, warfare uh, field of battle. I mean, I literally had Canadian Operation Unifier troops saying, we now know what exact angle uh, to hit a Russian BMP from, because the Ukrainians know from practice, uh, if, if that were ever to, to, to be necessary. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, we, we are part of a, 
uh, well-oiled, sometimes cumbersome, sometimes crusty uh, NATO structure, uh, highly institutionalized. That helps us because it helps things keep, roll keep rolling over. Uh, the Ukraine mission isn't a NATO mission, but it's about NATO standards and achieving as many of those as, uh, as possible. But it also uh, then means that uh, we need to fill in some of the policy gaps for ourselves. Uh, we tend to approach them too much as independent plug and play elements of either military deployments or, uh, or policy and without taking a Canadian view of what it means to us and how Canadian ministers and Canadian senior commanders and senior foreign policy officials can play those cards within the broader Euro, uh, Euro Atlantic space. Uh, we are not just a, uh, or at least we shouldn't be, uh, participants uh, who happen to stumble into roles, but we should know the roles and shape the roles, not just for the common benefit, but also for our national comparative advantage. Um, there's also a, a broader alliance issue, uh, which is uh, wanting to once again chase the out of area role while not necessarily seeking to uh, address the very real, very conventional, almost boringly conventional threat uh, you're facing from a country that uh, Christian Leuprecht described as uh, as revanchist and revisionist. Uh, so, for example, in April, we had the Russian mobilization of 80 to 100,000 troops, uh, depending on how you count it, uh, 48 to uh, around 60 uh, battle groups around the Ukrainian border. And uh, this is, of course, precisely the sort of uh, operation for which a uh, military alliance, uh, which has a flank, uh, has been formed, uh, but politically there's this tendency to say, this cannot be happening. Uh, how real is this? Uh, let's instead worry about bio threats in Tajikistan uh, and ignore the 48 uh, BTGs uh, somewhere on the Ukrainian border. Uh, you know, we are practically addressing those issues. So I think Canada should have a view and should uh, seek a more active role, not only in doing the good we do, and very much appreciated by the Ukrainians, the Latvians, and regional countries, but also then in seeking the Canadian leverage and advantage uh, that taking a more Canadian 360 view uh, would give us. Excellent. Um, and I would love to come back when we come back to what should we do more um, to hear how we can sort of leverage um, you know, Canadian presence to, to not only defend our allies, but also promote Canadian interests and, and defend them and how we can integrate it better and what we need to do um, do more. I think that's that's a very important uh, point to highlight. Now, I'd like to turn to Marcus. Um, Marcus, you, know, you 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 are in the trenches <laughs> uh, uh, of sorts uh, to, 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 you know, uh, to talk about um, uh, with the disinformation, with the political warfare, with the subversion attempts um, uh, of, of authoritarian regimes from Russia to China that undermine or try to undermine um, our societies here in the West, but also our, our partners uh, in the Eastern flank. You have uh, you know, extensive experience with that personal experience as well. Um, give us a bit of the lay of the land in, 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 in that space from Baltics uh, to the Black Sea and and, and, and what what can we do more and, and what are we doing right now? Well, thank you, Balkan, for the uh, for the introduction and and of course MLI and Konradarnau Stiftung for all the support uh, and work that you've provided to make today's webinar happen. And of course, my amazing co-panelists, um, Christian Jill and Ambassador Waschuk. It's a huge honor to share the uh, the screen with you. Um, Balkan, as you mentioned, uh, my perspective on the Kremlin's operations to subvert uh, Western democracies and Canada's alliances is from the front lines as a as a journalist. Uh, as an advocate and an activist with a focus on monitoring and exposing Russian and other foreign disinformation and, uh, and influence operations. Um, but I'd like to start off by saying that Canada's leadership of the NATO EFP in, in Latvia 
is is really critically important from both a strategic standpoint and a moral one for for all three Baltic states. I'm, I'm Estonian in, in heritage. Um, it's one of the most important peacekeeping missions that Canada could be engaged in today. And I think that the, that the Canadian government needs to do a much better job of actually communicating this uh, to Canadians and to remind Canadians why uh, why NATO matters. Um, now, despite what Russian state propagandists would try to make us believe, the threat that our Baltic allies face from Russia is is very real. And it has been rising since 2007 when the Kremlin tried to destabilize Estonia during the Bronze Soldier Riots. Despite this and the simultaneous Russian government cyber attack against Estonia, um, Canada and our allies ignored calls to reinforce NATO's eastern frontier and failed to take the, the threat seriously. When Russia invaded Georgia the following summer, uh, the hand-wringing continued, and in the absence of any seri serious deterrence, Vladimir Putin, of course, invaded Crimea and Donbass in 2014. Um, the consequences uh, we've since imposed to limit Putin's military aggression in the form of sanctions and, of course, the NATO EFP, they seem to be working. Um, but we continue to allow Putin to operate in the gray zone between war and peace, to undermine and destabilize our alliances, democracies, and societies. In this context, there are two areas of immediate concern that I'd like to bring up today. First is the threat of Kremlin disinformation and influence operations that target the Baltic region and Canada. Second is the emerging migrant crisis that's being manufactured by Alexander Lukashenko on Belarus's border with Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland. Um, while Canada's intelligence community, primarily CSIS, has taken the threat of foreign interference and disinformation seriously, um, the Canadian government writ large really has not. Um, I still hear some Canadian pundits and academics dismissing Russian hybrid and grey zone operations as innocent, innocent shenanigans or sly mischief undertaken by Vladimir Putin. Um, the reality is quite different. For the Baltic nations, the threat of modern Russian hybrid warfare and the destabilization it aims to cause has been a primary and existential concern since Estonia's bronze soldier rise. But the Baltic governments have so far been able to successfully address it. Uh, the Kremlin's interference operations targeting the US 2016 presidential elections are well known if already somewhat forgotten, but the long-term impact of the extreme division that it caused remains to be seen. Uh, the COVID pandemic has been exploited by the Russian government to further polarize Western societies and to intensify the damage caused by the virus. The EU's External Action Service warned of this already back in March 2020. Um, Kremlin aligned narratives have ranged from conspiracies about the origins of the virus to the legitimization and amplification of anti-mask and anti-vaccination movements. Uh, these have resulted in terribly toxic divisions in nations from Estonia to Canada, which have morphed into significant and potentially destabilizing anti-government movements. Worse yet, uh, is that Russian state-backed narratives that promote vaccine hesitancy are literally killing us. The evidence of this is overwhelming. In fact, a few months ago, we discovered that the Russian embassy in Ottawa was directly promoting vaccine hesitancy propaganda on its website. The Baltic nations recognize that the threat of malign foreign information, warfare, and gray zone tactics is persistent and evolving. The situation on the Lithuanian, Latvian, and Polish borders with Belarus is deeply concerning, uh, and it's a deeply concerning example of this, where Lu Al Alexander Lukashenko, with the likely blessing of the Kremlin, has weaponized migration against our NATO allies. Migrants have been transported from Iraq to Belarus with the promise of an EU vacation, and these migrants are then transported by Belarusian authorities to the Latvian, Lithuanian, and Polish borders and are literally pushed across it. Over 10,000 migrants have flooded the border over the past two months in what is clearly an operation that is intended to destabilize the border and surrounding regions. The Kremlin, of course, had previous success in helping create the Syrian refugee crisis, which had a long-term destabilizing effect on Europe that precipitated the rise of several far-right Kremlin-friendly parties in Europe. Uh, Canada was also directly affected by the Syrian crisis. During the 2015 election, a young Syrian boy was pictured washed up on a Turkish beach and brought the world's attention to the crisis. Then the Canadian immigration minister, Chris Alexander, was blamed rather unreasonably and based on some misinformation for not doing enough for the child and his family, which had submitted an incomplete refugee application earlier. The story became a major election headline that contributed to a decline in conservative popularity and the conservatives actually ended up losing that election. Canada and its allies in Eastern Europe must now be prepared for the coming 
Afghan refugee crisis. This month, 32 Afghan refugees were identified on Poland's border with Belarus. The Kremlin and its allies will seek to exploit the coming flood of them, and we must be prepared to address that. My last point, um, we need to do a much better job of learning from our Eastern partners and allies. The threats they face today are the ones we will face tomorrow. The information warfare that Estonia faced in 2007 was a clear warning of the Kremlin's tactics and the current global information epidemic that is a threat to all Western liberal democracies. Canada should be working much more closely with our democratic allies to develop a strategy to deter Russian and Chinese efforts to interfere and undermine our democracy and society. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Marcus, um, for this you know, quite detailed and, and specific observations and, and, and a warning about well, what is what is to come. And I, I agree uh, with the sort of the extent to which uh, in a Kremlin and, and its proxies are taking um, advantage of our, our, our societal structures and trying to undermine it, and that we are not necessarily completely aware of that, apart from um, certain segments of the government and, and society, and that we're not really talking enough about what Lukashenko uh, and, and its regime is doing um, to our to our NATO allies and and, and weaponizing, um, like many dictators uh, before him, um, the human suffering um, to advance um, his own interests and undermine undermine other societies. So I think that's a very important um, uh, issue that we need to we need to speak more, and I'll, I'll come back to it um, later on. Um, now, after laying the groundwork of, of what we are doing and why it is important and, and why, why, why we really sort of, it is in the Canadian uh, national interest to be there, I would like to sort of um, uh, shift, um, switch to uh, the question of what to do. Why can we do more and what should we do more? So in a more prescriptive and normative sense, uh, what can what Canadian policy um, should be when, when when it comes to defending our allies as well as our our interests and values in the region. I'd like to start with uh, with Christians. You, you already sort of highlighted the fact and the need um, uh, to to think more strategically to recognize the sort of changing geopolitical uh, landscape and and having Canada uh, to to develop a better sense of how to connect its limited resources to its national interest. Uh, in the region. Um, but could you sort of elaborate on that and open that up for us a little bit about what should Canada do more uh, or or do less, uh, for that matter, um, to um, to advance uh, our, our interests as well as defend uh, our allies and values in, in the region? Over to you, Christian. Balkan, if I may, um, I might defer to um, um, Roman Rastrick and Jill Sinclair on this, since they worked in the bureaucracy on precisely this type of problem, and then sort of maybe I can uh, help sort of connect perhaps some some broader uh, broader relations on this. But I think from a because we get both the civilian perspective and the military perspective, so we get the whole civil military component. Um, uh, because I think some of this is related to broader political issues. Some of this related to the level of uh, informed debate. Um, uh, in Canadian society, um, uh, but I think some of this is also related to uh, our own bureaucratic pr uh, bureaucracy, both in process and substance. But maybe I'll defer to my uh, my two colleagues initially on this. Sounds good, and I'll get I'll get back to you on more the more the, you know, the, the the strategic component and perhaps having a better understanding of what Americans are doing and how we can actually position ourselves uh, later on on that position in in a minute. Uh, Roman, maybe I'll I'll start with you. You have a, a a piece coming up uh, with MLI, yeah. a fantastic piece um, that I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to share with everyone. Um, um, but what you know, sort of, could you uh, g give our audience a, a glimpse of that and, and and a sense of what should we do? Uh, what are sort of the flaws and and what needs to be improved? Uh, th this is going to sound a bit uh, disingenuous, but we're already doing quite well. Uh, Canada actually has the largest on the ground presence of all the countries engaged in training, bigger even than the US. The US is bigger in equipment supplies. Uh, but even if you looked at uh, the Ukrainian Independence Day parade, uh, foreign military units, uh, the Canadian contingent uh, marching in it was the biggest one uh, of the foreign contingents. Uh, but because of our electoral campaign and the writ convention, there was zero Canadian political representation. So again, you are actually, uh, th this is the opposite of what people see as the usual Canadian problem, which is 
talk big and then inability to act. Here we are acting, but we're unable to talk uh, for domestic Canadian uh, political reasons. Uh, so I would, uh, I would uh, think that, again, I, I come back to this notion that we need to do more of our own thinking and uh, I can draw on that from a, it, it's an anecdotal situation, but it may have been a bit of a premonition. Uh, the uh, spring of 2019 uh, in Kiev was the time when uh, President Trump and his acolytes were essentially trying to take down and did take down the American ambassador uh, in Kiev, Ambassador Yovanovitch, uh, our friend and colleague. And that let, the rest of us, the sort of the, the five eyes or the sort of close NATO ally ambassadors in this peculiar situation where we no longer knew what we could share with our American partners and realized we had to meet with each other and figure it out for ourselves. Uh, now, again, that was a very specific uh, situation, but I think it means that we need to have uh, in our minds and somewhere on paper, our own views uh, on where we think uh, the Euro-Atlantic space and this particular region should be going and how we can work with a range of partners. And of course, we have eight uh, military partners in Latvia and we have uh, four or five uh, training partners in Ukraine in uh, making it work, but also always maintaining the operational to political linkage uh, that has to go both ways. Excellent. Um, I think that that that's a quite an interesting anecdote, and I think it maybe, like you said, foreshadowed some of the other other issues. And we need to be uh, the, 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 what you highlighted is, is quite um, uh, quite stark. I, I would argue, you know, that we that, that it's actually flipped. It's that we are walking the walk, but we're not really talking the talk um, in this in this particular case. Uh, with that, I want to turn to 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 Jill, who you're on the ground. Uh, you are very much sort of involved in in in, in this situation, um, and and as Roman has pointed out, we are actually sort of doing a lot. But um, uh, what else? Uh, in 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 the sense that what well, you know, there's always possibility to improvement, and there's always you know, possibility of, of you know, explaining it uh, better, learning better. Um, what else Canada can do, and and perhaps should do when it comes to defending our interests um, in the region as well as supporting our allies and partners. Thanks, Balkan. Well, I'm going to take a slightly different tact on this because I actually think that the best way to, you know, help our, our friends is to make sure that we help ourselves in the following way. Uh, securing the flank begins with securing our democracy. And I think that unless we have an awareness that we are actually under attack, I mean, some of the, the things that Marcus just talked about, um, the sort of the, in, the insidiousness of this undermining of trust of the institutions of democratic practice, um, a sort of a, an, an awakening out of a complacency that Canadians I think have about their democracy. And to remind ourselves that democracy is hard work, especially in a, in a complicated, complex country like Canada. So I think we really need to start by looking at home, at looking at what we control, because we can only be a good partner for others if we are robust in ourselves. And I. And I, I don't want to over-exaggerate it, but I do think that there's a need to have a recognition there. I also think, and my colleagues have alluded to this, I think that we do need to um, try to develop a little bit more of a strategic culture. Um, we do have this sense that, and Rome, Roman's uh, anecdote was wonderful, but it shows that, you know, we're used to either, you know, we're, we're used to flying with a wingman or we're loose, used to being under the umbrella of, you know, of the United States or however you want to describe it. But honestly, uh, that world uh, has changed. It isn't that it's changing, it has changed. And Christian laid out a whole of the, the new dynamics for the United States. There's nothing new in countries having their interests and privileging those, but it's manifesting itself in ways that we haven't seen previously. And I think that we need to develop a bit of a strategic culture in, in Canada. And there, I believe that we can, you know, we can learn from countries like, like Ukraine. We can learn from countries like, like Latvia and, and the, the Baltic states. Uh, what it means to be a resilient democracy. Their democracies have been and are being stress test all the time and ours aren't necessarily. And that's a, that's a lovely position to be in, but it may not be a sustainable one as the world gets a little bit weirder, uh, just not to make a too eloquent a statement on that. 
Uh, the other thing I think we need to look at is to just have a, a wider and a more integrated concept of our national interests. Um, Oops, we suddenly um, lost uh, Jill, I believe. Um, so while we're waiting for her, we, which I think is an excellent point, so it reminded me of the uh, this the saying about you know Canada being you know, uh, housed with, with fireproof um, structures away from fire. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore, and 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 maybe uh, uh, more Canadians uh, need to be aware of that 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 strategic structure change. Let me uh, get, get to Marcus while we're waiting for uh, for Jill to join us again. Uh, Marcus, what you know, you're you're in the trenches. You're dealing with and, and 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 working with our allies in the region. You are trying to sort of raise awareness and and. And, and warn the public and the, and, and, and the policymakers about the dangers we're, we're facing. Um, what what do we need to do more? Both both at home, um, you know, recognizing the the threats perhaps emanating from, uh, but also supporting um, our allies and partners. Well, I just I'll pick up where where Jill sort of left off, and and I think there's a question here that 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 can, Canadians need to answer, and that's um, specifically defining what our interests are and whether you know, our basic core democratic values are worth fighting for. We, we, we're doing a great job in Ukraine, um, but I think we need to do it a, a, a little bit more broadly. Um, in the context of foreign interference, um, Canada needs to recognize that the threat posed by Russia and China, Iran and others uh, towards the Western liberal democratic order is one that is persistent and it's only growing. Um, and I don't think we fully acknowledge uh, the threat like our allies in Taiwan, the Baltics, Ukraine, Finland and Sweden have. And we really need to learn from them. Um, and, and probably most importantly, we need to start imposing costs and consequences on bad actors and their behavior, whether it's their interference in our democracy, transnational repression, human rights abuses, corruption, etc. Um, Canada's Sergei Magnitsky law, which I was proud to have been involved in, in helping pass, uh, allows us to hold corrupt human rights violators to account with visa bans and asset freezes. Um, we should also apply sanctions against foreign organizations that pollute our information environment with disinformation, like RT in Russia, CGTN and CCTV in China. Um, our government is, is pretty great at making excuses for not using our Magnitsky law, including nonsense about onerous thresholds for evidence and such, um, and we're really terrible at using it. Um, that needs to change, and the new Canadian government needs to use this tool if it wishes defend, to defend our values. Um, the Baltic nations, as well as Finland and Sweden, have also recognized that the threat of Russian interference is, is one that aims to subvert the cohesion of our societies and have adopted whole-of-society approaches to defending against it. Canada has not yet, uh, and we should learn how to build long-term resilience against foreign disinformation from these nations. This includes robust you know, early childhood digital media literacy, cyber literacy, um, and all elected officials and their staff should be receiving mandatory training. In Sweden, an entire government department has been dedicated to defending Swedes against uh, psychological warfare. Finally, in the context of Russia, um, we really should take example of the Lithuanian and, and Latvian leadership in supporting and protecting Russian and Belarusian uh, opposition activists. Latvia and Lithuania allow vulnerable activists and journalists from these countries to safely continue developing and working. And Canada should be contributing to this broader effort and offer asylum, for example, to all vulnerable activists and, and journalists from that region. Anyway, those are just a few thoughts. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. I mean, these are very concrete things that I think Canada had the capacity to do um, and, and can do, uh, and, and, but, but it requires the sort of the organization and, and, and the political will to, to push forward. And I think uh, it's very important to sort of um, uh, keep uh, keep bringing this up as, as these are not sort of things uh, that 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 require a complete rehaul of of this and that. These are within very much um, uh, with the existing tools we have that we can actually um, uh, significantly help. Uh, I'll go back to um, uh, to, to Jill who, um, who who joins back uh, us again. Uh, great to have you back again, uh, uh, Jill. Uh, you you just dropped off when you were talking about the need to. Um, develop and then focus on the strategic culture. And, and as you just drop off, I, I mentioned that sort of the, the old saying about, you know, Canada being a you know, fireproof house away from all fires is perhaps no longer true uh, in this changing environment. And we, we were not maybe aware or, or awakened to that, that fact um, as a society. So uh, let me turn back to you to, uh, to, to continue your, your intervention. 
Thank you very much, Balkan. I'm very sorry. I don't know what happened there. Look, and I'll be I'll be really brief. Uh, because it sounds to me, in fact, that Marcus has touched on a number of the things that, that I wanted to talk about. I think we need to learn from our partners and how to build a resilient democracy. Uh, and again, apologies if I'm repeating myself. I say they've been stress tested. We have not. We can learn from them, uh, particularly uh, the Baltic countries and Ukraine. There is a lot there. Um, and we, you know, it isn't to turn ourselves into a national security kind of state. But there's no question that we need greater awareness of what the challenges are and how to make ourselves resilient and robust in that regard. Um, I also think that we need to, to develop uh, through dialogue the sorts of things you're promoting here, but it's just a wider concept of our national interests and to look at them in an integrated way. Um, if anybody's taken a look at the UK uh, integrated review, you know, they've married up a comprehensive articulation of national security and international policy. I think the time has come for Canada to do that. I'm not talking about big white papers and green papers and those interminable processes. This is a this is an, a real time conversation to be had where we go well beyond whole of government, which is so archaic given the, the rapidity of change and the need to be agile and all of that. We need to go to real coherence and unity of purpose and action when we are doing things international. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that's, that's quite the case yet, but I see a lot of potential for that. We see how it can work at, at missions abroad. Roman, when he was ambassador in Ukraine, the current ambassador, Larissa Galadza, are bringing a team Canada, whole of Canada approach to the political, the economic, the development, the defense instruments and integrating them. That needs to actually happen back in Ottawa too with strategic purpose and design, a lot more deliberateness there with this integration. The last point I would make is, you know, we need to sustain the effort. Um, and that, you know, that rings really, I think, acutely at the moment, given what's going on in Afghanistan. But our partners who are going to take risks for Euro-Atlantic security and values, principles, all of those things, they need to know that we will sustain our effort, that we are going to be deliberate in our interventions, in our investments, and in our partnerships, and treat them as partners for the long haul. Otherwise, it's going to get Hard, it's going to be hard to have anybody kind of protect our flanks if we won't do the work that we need to do to kind of build and make robust those flanks. Over. Um, excellent. I think this is this is a great place to sort of um, uh, segue to, to 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 Christian to especially on the on the notion of of the Canadian national interest and how to connect sort of define what those interests are in a much more clear way and and connect and the the, the available resources to that in a in a more sort of high level strategic uh, position um over to you christian how do we do that what do you, what what do we need to do so a few concrete items and perhaps some of my colleagues might also have some uh, some critiques or something to add to those items so one is of course we have in canada what i've long called a rather homeopathic posture when it comes to security intelligence and defense um, and uh, uh, as we all know, that homeopathy is, uh, is 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 one part of a remedy, but in many cases it requires additional measures in order to achieve the effect that you want. And so I'm not quite sure we're currently uh, postured to achieve that effect. Now, Canadian politicians have always been uh, astute at the art of the possible. That is to say, uh, they have always been prepared to spend just enough, uh, and they see, especially institutions such as the Canadian Armed Forces, not as a military tool, but I think as a tool to assert the national interest. Uh, but I would say that just enough is no longer enough. And so uh, if there's no new money, then, and I'll get back to this in a moment, then we're going to need to think much more carefully about what we want this institution to do. Um, we also think, you know, Canadians always want to do institution building. And look, I'm all for institution building and all those things. But in the end, when Russian missiles start flying, institutions aren't going to defend you against the missiles. So, uh, so I think we also need to strike a little bit of a balance here, a realist balance, uh, that there are very real threats, uh, very concrete threats, and that these are capacities you can sort of build on the fly when all of a sudden the missiles start flying and you decide, oh, now would be a good time to defend ourselves. Uh, so we, we do need to hedge a little bit. And of course, the whole point of the investment in national defense when it comes to collective defense is precisely to avert this type of conflict. So I think if the Russians and um, 
adversaries such as China um, are ratcheting up. Iran, whose missiles are in the foreseeable future going to be able to reach the east coast of the United States, which will considerably change the conversation about ballistic missile defense when those missiles can not only land in Vancouver uh, from North Korea, but they can also land in Ottawa or Toronto. I think you know that we need to, I think, have a, have a realistic uh, assessment um, of if our adversaries are uh, gearing up, then so need we. I think concretely on our horizon needs to be renewal of the frame of, of both the enhanced forward presence overall, as well as in particular framework uh, nation commitments. And we need to be aware that some of those commitments are more perilous than others. Uh, the commitment by Germany to Lithuania, I mean, is a very important commitment, a substantial um, um, uh, it's, it's a substantial commitment for Germany to send um, uh, th this headquarters and, uh, and brigade component um, into, uh, into its neighboring country. And it only happened because of leadership from the current chancellor. Because the current chancellor just said, this is going to happen and we're going to do this. And then parliament signed off on it. Um, as we know, the election in Germany could go any which way here. Um, and that could, for instance, jeopardize um, uh, the German commitment in Lithuania. And so Canada needs to work hard to be able to show resolve and commitment um, in its own efforts uh, in the region and across the flank so that other countries uh, will continue to join us in this effort to demonstrate not just the defense component, but of course, the political resolve. And of course, so much of the EFP is about that political resolve and don't give the Russians any opportunity to drive uh, a wedge uh, in NATO's commitment with regards to its flank in general and the EFP in particular. I also think you know that there's perhaps an opportunity for us to be um, we have a joint delegation at NATO. Uh, I think the uh, delegation has been quite effective, but we need to realize that uh, ultimately these decisions are being made on the political side, not on the military side. And so you can contribute whatever you want on the military side, but you need to be robustly postured on the, uh, um, on the diplomatic side. And so I think Canada needs to remind itself that that post um, and what it brings to bear, especially politically, uh, in NATO is going to become, in light of the challenges we discussed, uh, even more important than to make sure it always has very robust capacities um, in that regard. Canada also needs to be clear, I think, when it comes to NATO uh, renewal, that um, it coordinates with its allies um, on which capabilities it is going to build out in its Canadian armed forces. So Jill Sinclair mentioned the integrated review. Um, what partially came out of that is, uh, and, and it was already in, in, in process before, is that the UK armed forces are going to double down on being a high tech uh, digital force. Now that's great. The problem is that the Brits didn't coordinate that with the other NATO members. They simply decided this is what they were going to do. And so I think there's opportunity for us within NATO to make sure, and the Germans, which actually in many ways like uh, uh, came up with this whole framework nation concept, not originally for the EFP, but in order to coordinate with other countries that didn't have full spectrum capabilities. So I think uh, Canada needs to make sure it leads by example on specialization. Um, and I think there's, and we can get back to this in the third part of the discussion here, but there's lots of conversations to be had about specialization. Even the French, which have a pretty robust force, have essentially three postures. Uh, a posture to intervene in the Sahara Sahel and Francophone Africa, a posture for collective defense, European defense, national defense, and they have their nuclear posture. So those are their three armies. So even the French aren't pretending that they're going to do everything. The Brits have decided basically that, I mean, they've significantly reduced their land force cap capacity they're going to go high tech um, and they continue to remain uh, to to maintain a robust maritime presence. What is Canada going to do? We're still doing a little bit of everything. We're trying to keep everybody happy. And, you know, we take our uh, M777. This is not quite enough for the Canadian Armed Forces, but we keep shipping them back and forth uh, between CFP Wainwright and uh, and CFP Gagetown, depending on where they're where they're needed. Where are we actually going to double down in terms of uh, in terms of where we think our Canadian interests and commitments are um, um, are best served. And my last point is going to be a point on education. One area where we can learn, for instance, from our German colleagues is the Germans run something called the Bundesakademie für Sicherheit. Uh, so the, the, the Federal Academy for Security Policy, as they call it in translation. But really what Bax does is teach the comprehensive approach. It teaches whole of government to German federal and sub-state institutions so that when Germany goes abroad, 
uh, it's not a bunch of departments that are trying to figure out how to work together. The civil servants are systematically taught how to do this. This flows a little bit from the German tradition of Auftragstaktics, so the sense of that decisions are made by any one sort of brilliant general, but rather they are made by a staff and collectively by a staff and the ability to, for that staff to operate um, um, uh, to, to operate collectively rather than just relying on one sort of decision-making figure. But I think there's a lot to be learned here because the one organization that currently invests in, in, in systematically in lifelong professional development uh, that has a clear understanding of a body of knowledge uh, to transmit that body of knowledge, curate that body of knowledge uh, is the Canadian Armed Forces and especially the Canadian Forces College. And I think, um, you know, we do a nice job at talking about com comprehensive approach, but really when we really need to get it done, it seems that we need to have a task force in PMO that really doubles down and breathes down every everyone's neck to make sure that they actually do it. Um, and that doesn't need to happen in Germany. Germany knows how to do this because they teach it, they practice it. There is a systematic body of knowledge in Germany on the comprehensive approach. And so so if we want to be more effective, not just on the military side, but also on the civilian side and the whole of government side, um, and which is, of course, where Canadians always want Canada to be. They don't necessarily want, them, want Canada to be on the military side. They want to kind of double down on the civilian side uh, that we need to do uh, a little bit less talking about the comprehensive approach and do a little bit more in making small investments in systematic professional development uh, for our civil servants and our institutions so that we can be as effective as we possibly can with the very scarce resources that we have. Oh, I think this this is an excellent uh, point, and I'd like to sort of turn to the panel to to get their reactions on 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 what what Christian uh, sort of laid out in terms of uh, what what we need to sort of think more more in the sort of the strategic realm, but also in a, in a very concrete uh, concrete sense. Any if 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 any of our, our our panelists would like to um, would like to jump in and intervene, uh, Roman, please go ahead. Uh, I'm having policy PTSD here uh, uh, in that uh, I was part of it and uh, some of my colleagues did much more on attempts to create a civilian deployment capacity for Canada as part of a comprehensive approach. But frankly, our current public service rules and the sort of cost-cutting mentality of civilian departments that doesn't allow for any doubling up of roles uh, as the military does, because the military are always one third training, one third deploying, one third recovering. Uh, there is no such capacity in civilian departments. And there has so far been zero desire to pay for or build it in. Until we create some of that flex within civilian departments, we won't be able to realize the civilian deployment uh, dream. Uh, I think another element and this is this is really difficult because it it is literally a life and death issue is that our initial afghanistan experience led us to pay such extreme attention to duty of care is that it has now sort of sloshed over into collective system risk aversion uh which again makes uh operating especially on the civilian side extremely difficult in any environment where things are not a hundred percent uh, guaranteed. So these are difficult discussions which we will need to have with ourselves as well as with our allies. I mean, I think this is an excellent, excellent point, particularly with regards to the the, the, the differentiation between uh, you know extreme risk aversion on the one hand and risk management and and, and mitigation on the other end, and how um, sort of not getting that balance uh, correct uh, could be paralyzing and could create unforeseen risks uh, down in the road because it creates fragilities when you are faced with a crisis, uh, but you don't have the uh, capacity and the experience to be able to do that. If you don't have those smaller sort of take, if you didn't take those smaller risks and, and risk those smaller losses, you might actually end up paying a much higher price down the road because you would like to ensure 100% um, you know, uh, risk-free environment, which, which doesn't exist. I think um, that, that's a very important point. Uh, Jill, uh, I think you have, um, you have an intervention over here. Thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, Christian laid out a lot of interesting ideas here. I guess, uh, I'll, first of all, I'll take on the one on, on money. You, you mentioned just in passing, Christian, new money. And I'd like to suggest that money's nice, but I think combined effort uh, is even better. Because if I look at the billions in the defense budget and, you know, you, you just look at what we are investing, I do not believe for one moment that we can't do it better. I just, I just, I don't believe that. And I think, as I say, money's good. And certainly 
when you look at the level of ambition that the government has uh, and, and, and what's put in front of Canadian Armed Forces to deliver, that has to be resourced appropriately or the level of ambition has to be modified. That's not always easy to get governments uh, to, to do, to marry up those two things. But there is an awful lot that we could do better. And this relates to the point that you were just talking about, Balkan. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of doing stuff abroad, uh, Canadians do need to be better prepared. And, you know, the military, CAF is not superb just because they're superb. They're superb because they educate, they train, they exercise relentlessly. And uh, as Roman said, I mean, the investment that is made in producing a team of people who can work together on any issue at any moment is massive. And that we haven't yet done that in the on the civilian departments. And I think you could make the argument that, you know, public health, we, we've already moved past COVID, it seems, uh, in some of the discussions we're having. But just look, if we had had a more interoperable um, uh, public service, we talk about interoperability in the NATO context. I think we need to look at it uh, in the, the civilian context and the public service more broadly. Um, public service doesn't have the same um, skill set in planning that uh, any you know junior military officer has so there's a lot a lot to be done there and my third point would be we don't have to do it all i.e canadians I mean, one of the great things that's going on in ukraine at the moment is it's ukrainians who are doing stuff okay we're enabling we are enabling ukrainians so we need to build up the capacity of our partners i know again this might sound a little bit you know, uh, a little bit lame given what's going on in Afghanistan, but we need to build up the capacity of our partners because the change, the transformation, the work, the conflict management, whatever it is, it has to be indigenous to be sustainable. Um, and that gets back to my point. You can only do that over a long-term commitment. So that means we have to know what our interests are, invest in them, put the right resources in place, and then stick with it. Over. Uh, thank you very much, July. I think, the, you know, all the speakers, you know, uh, so far um, highlighted the, the, the importance, and, and Christian sort of laid out very nicely the, the, the education and the incentive structures that are actually um, uh, existing for for the policymakers. And I would like to tie this into um, a, a, an audience question. PK asks: um, It has been over two weeks since the federal election has been called. All of the political parties have rarely mentioned Canadian foreign policy and its commitments abroad. And you know, think about it: this is going on while there is a mass um, going on in Afghanistan, and you know, you all read uh, the the suicide bombing uh, attack on the Kabul airport um, this morning, for example. Um, how concerning is this? How concerning this lack of of, of foreign policy? Um, you know, talk and discussion. I know, you know, part of the reason I would argue is is one of the reasons why we don't have this. Um, matching of, of capabilities, intent, and, and resources is that the incentive structures for the policymakers are not necessarily there. And in a democratic society, um, it re does really matter whether the, the public at large is paying attention and is, is requiring its, its politicians, its policymakers, um, to follow through those, those commitments. And this, this sense of um, throughout the Cold War, the, the, the sense of safety uh, that, that, that the Canadians feel that they don't need to sort of, they like as, 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 as Christian pointed out, just enough has been enough and that we can continue like that, um, seems to still dominate, dominate the public, public perception. And without that public pressure uh, and with, in the absence of, of a major disaster, the, the, the incentives doesn't seem to be aligning um, to, to pay more re attention and, and, and optimize resources. Um, but how, concern, how, how should we, how much, con you know, we, sh we should be concerned about this uh, to get back to, back to it. Um, and I'd like to sort of open up um, to the panel to get their, their, their views before getting the last, uh, last comments um, uh, to think about the future. Uh, if, if anyone would like to go first, um, I'll, I'll start with that. How concerning should be uh, we about sort of the, the relative lack of attention but by the political parties in uh, with regards to the elections uh, on, on foreign policy. Jill, go ahead. A Balkan, I'll just I'll just take a, a go at it. I mean, I, I sort of alluded to this when I was talking about the, the polling that had been done in Ukraine. I mean, Canadians don't generally get uh, deeply involved in issues of foreign policy, right? Because we still seem to think that foreign policy is sort of optional and that interventions are matters of choice, not of need. So I, I do think this gets back to a, a leadership question. And as I say, we don't want to develop a security society 
But I do think that the, this is the moment as we come out of this election, however it comes out, to have a bit more of a sober discussion about what does the world like look like? How does Canada have to position itself? What are the threats? Because there actually are threats that impinge on Canada's well-being and the well-being of Canadians. You know, if this was a massive Canadian consular crisis, you know, versus something that's still off in a distant land. Foreign policy and the role of, say, global affairs may be more front and center, but it seems that it's only consular emergencies that get uh, get the attention at the moment, not more esoteric uh, interest-based discussions. Uh, Roman, I, I think there's also a need to link our broad thematic goals and desires to actual capabilities and places where they happen. You know, we have declared a feminist foreign policy but how is that actually being translated into what's happening in afghanistan uh there you know apart from the odd ironic remark there isn't really a connection between that bold declaration and our capacity to do things or the priorities we develop in terms of who we're taking out what we're doing why we're doing it you know it, again coming back to the eastern flank uh, because we're physically present, because we're doing things, we're actually able to implement some of these broad ideas. You know, we can help mentor female officers in uh, the Ukraine Armed Forces, and I think it happens as well in the Latvian Armed Forces. That it, it encourage them, you know, new opportunities to be opened up. Uh, similarly, you know, whether it's human rights, equality rights, but we we have to make the linkage between our broad declarations and stuff we actually do and maybe reverse the the lens for a while and focus more on building out from capacity than declaring and then hoping it somehow magically happens i think that's a that's an excellent point in terms of um you know not putting the the, the, the cart before the horse um but to figure out what kind of a horse we have first to to see what kind of a cart we can pull um i think that's a, a, a very sort of realistic way of, of putting it christian over to you so uh, our interests are fairly mutable if you read so the defense white papers or defense policies over the years uh, you can see that there's a lot of continuity and it doesn't even matter that much uh, which particular party is in power. But I think the structural conditions to be able to reinforce and assert those interests uh, are changing and are changing quickly. And so uh, Canada, I think, needs to double down on this capacity to define and understand what those interests are and how to align its national resources to assert those interests. And I think that's what the previous conversation was about also in terms of uh, civilian deployments, for instance, that we understand that this isn't just a conversation about deploying the Canadian Armed Forces, but that grand strategy is ultimately about mustering your national resources across the full spectrum in order to be able to um, assert and if need be defend those national interests. And for medium sized countries, that's always going to be a struggle because those those resources will always be um, um, will always be limited. The other, I think, challenge in terms of the election campaign is that look, foreign policy. You, you don't win elections on foreign policy. I mean, the one election that we had is uh, is perhaps 1988, the free trade agreement, um, and uh, um, uh, perhaps 1911 um, with Wilfred Laurier, but uh, the the and that's because foreign policy traditions are it's said it's sort of the purview of kings, it's sort of the purview of elites, and we don't the people don't really care and we don't really get the people involved. But the problem is, of course, that the elites haven't been particularly smart in their decision making in 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 recent decades. I mean, look at the two most disastrous decisions in the last 25 years: admitting China to the World Trade Organization and the invasion of Iraq. Um, and we increasingly have also a group of advisors. Um, um, uh, uh, with, without impugning anyone in particular. But I think if you look at the advisors, even among uh, some of the leading countries in the world, shall we say, uh, we used to have advisors that brought decades of experience to their portfolios. Uh, now we have people with um, surprising amounts of inexperience making decisions that have momentous implications for local, for local, uh, for 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 local citizens, uh, for the alliance, 
uh, for the credibility um, of countries and, um, uh, and their broader strategic interests. And so I'm deeply concerned that we increasingly have elites who are making um, very uninformed decisions, very short-sighted, often in extremely short runway political interests. And that we, both as a society, but also as a civil service, um, need to do a much better job at pushing back against some of those decisions, at pushing our leaders of actually making key decisions, making them in good time rather than dithering, because the longer you dither, the, the smaller your uh, the narrower your, your, your room for maneuver becomes in terms of the instruments that are available to you uh, and how you deploy those instruments for maximum effect. Um, and I think we should be deeply concerned about, um, uh, about what elites have brought us over the last 25 years and how we can make sure that the next 25 years under even greater international strain than the last 25 years will not bring us some of those, uh, some of the strategic blunders um, and the consequences that we currently live with. I think this is an excellent point to um, to pivot to sort of getting your, we have about five minutes left um, to get one minute sort of concluding remarks, having a future forward looking um, uh, uh, point. And and I, I totally agree with, with Christian's uh, point that our elites seem to lose that, you know, the practical wisdom, the phronesis uh, capability that that is required to, to for, for a political elite um, to to maintain that that trust with the society, and we need to be actually pushing back, and and that's that's that, that, that's very very important. Let me start with Marcus. Uh, your one minute sort of uh, last uh, concluding remark with a forward looking, future looking uh, perspective, and sure. I'll get back to Jill and then Roman, um, and then Christian if you have uh, last last things to say. So just quickly, I, I did manage to look at the conservative platform a few days ago, and there is a, a significant part of it that is dedicated to foreign policy. So foreign policy is being discussed by at least one party. I suspect the other ones will release their platforms later. Uh, but during a four week election, I'm, I'm not sure that um, there'll be much airtime given to any of those uh, those issues. Um I want to reiterate the need for us to start taking foreign interference seriously and to and to start imposing costs on those governments and actors that seek to destabilize us. Um, when we look at the U.S. 2016 presidential elections and the chaos that Russian interference caused, um, those the cost of those operations to the Kremlin was less than a main battle tank. So without any cost, there's no reason why Russia, China, or any other malign nation would not continue engaging in interference and, uh, and influence operations designed to destabilize. us. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we need to do a much, much better job of telling the story of our missions in Latvia and Ukraine to Canadians, especially now during an election, um, so that we understand why these missions and the Canadians understand why these missions are important uh, to us and why we need to continue contributing to them. Um, and so we are in election and uh, and in each election, and I'm sure in this one as well, um, the issue of peacekeeping will probably come up um, and the need to contribute more to peacekeeping missions. But as Roman said, when you know we are walking the walk in in Ukraine and Latvia, and we just need to start talking about it a bit more. Oh, excellent. I think I'd like to also give a shout out to, to Kevin Rex, our ambassador to the Baltics, who have been doing an excellent job in terms of bringing it up and, and working with with our allies. Um, on that and and more uh, Canadians need to more hear need to hear more about that as well. Uh, Jill, uh, over to you for your last um, concluding remarks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Look, I think it's all about uh, awareness. I, th I think there is a need to have a greater strategic awareness of the complexity of the world and the challenges that are out there. And I understand that political leaders don't want to frighten publics, um, but uh, but I think there is a really uh, a need to do this in a very uh, deliberate way and to get sort of a little bit beyond complacency. So to prepare Canadians for the discussion, for the investments, for the policy approaches that we've been talking about. With regard to the role of foreign policy in the election, I think it's kind of, it's slightly ironic that we're saying it's not there when in fact, of course, Afghanistan is being, you know, parsed every which way. And so foreign policy is, maybe not in the abstract, but in the in the, the practical sense of what was this all about? Where did we make the investment? Did it make sense? So my other thing is awareness and let's just learn some lessons and start to apply them. Okay. Christian, over to you for your 30 second um, take. 
So we're going to be confronted with more choices between wars of choice and collective defense. Um, and we need to, I think, be prepared for the collective defense piece. We're going to have to make some very difficult trade-offs. Um, where are we going to put our efforts? Uh, there's uh, challenges, significant and expensive challenges on NORAD renewal, on collective defense, and with regards to NATO, uh, on national defense, and the Asia-Pacific. And uh, I think this will present political challenges in terms of where do we want to, how do we want to posture ourselves, where do we want to double down? And my sense is um, that while we need a presence in the Asia-Pacific, for instance, here's an opportunity for us uh, to say to the Americans that we're going to reinforce our commitments to Europe and to European stability um, and security so that uh, the United States can pivot uh, where it believes its, um, um, its interests lie. And I think as a country, we're probably going to need to have a conversation about what do we want our Canadian Armed Forces to do, primarily national defense, primarily international security, or primarily human security. The United States is the only force that is large enough to be able to do all three of those. Most other countries can do one, some can do one and a little bit of the, of the other. Um, I think we've pretended that we can do it all with the very limited resources that we have, uh, and we simply can't. And I think the, the, the previous comments in the last couple of minutes, I think already alluded to that. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a conversation that's ultimately a political conversation and decision to be had. Thank you very much, Christian. Roman, uh, last but not least to you for your 30 second last uh, commentary concluding remarks. You are muted. Yes, uh, I'd say keep it real, no theme without a time, place and capacity to act, but also no capacity without the ambition and a strategy on how to maximize Canada's leverage and effect. Uh, Afghanistan is, is an example of American ambivalence and we will need to expand a bit to fill uh, the emerging gaps. Um, thank you very much. Um, we are right on time. Um, I'd like to, maybe the 30 seconds over, I'd like to take this 30 second to thank all the panelists uh, for joining us today, the audience uh, watching and listening to us and, and uh, the Canada office of the Konrad Adenauer uh, Stiftung for making this uh, webinar uh, possible. I'd like to also thank um, uh, for the for the people who, you, who you cannot see on the on the screen to Brett, Allison, and, and Eric, uh, and Jacqueline, who are uh, working tirelessly to make this uh, go as smoothly as, as possible. Um, please go ahead and, and, and watch the other webinars that we, we did this in the Global Realignment series that we did together with Conrad Adenauer. Um, and, uh, keep an eye out on, on excellent commentary uh, on transatlantic issues and other issues that will be coming out um, at the McDonald Laurier uh, Institute's website. Uh, and once again, thanks for joining us today and hope to see you again in, in, in another, another webinar.